Zwerf, the European Money and Finance Forum, bringing together policymakers, finance, and academia. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we have a kind of fascinating panel about uh, the interactions between monetary and fiscal policy, where I think the topic really is about macroeconomic management. So generally, I would say that it has two dimensions. I mean, the first one is basically about current policies, or in a sense, I mean, the circumstances, the question would really be how to achieve the right policy mix uh, along the recovery path from, from, from the coronavirus crisis. And the second is about, I mean, policy frameworks. So it is both about monetary policy strategies, but also fiscal frameworks that guide the interaction between both policy areas in a more structural manner. What is interesting uh, to, uh, and what is, I mean, remarkable in having this topic today is that both, both topics, both dimensions are currently topical. So there, are dis there is discussion, a lot of discussion about policymakers, and there are ongoing reviews, I mean, both in Brussels, and that is forthcoming for the review of the Stability and Growth Pact, but also in Frankfurt, as far as the review of the monetary policy strategy is concerned. And of course, there is a lot of discussion about, uh, I mean, current policies and uh, what is our, what should, what's, what's the appropriate policy stance, both monetary policy stance, but also fiscal policy stance at the current juncture. So, so this, to discuss these, um, these issues, we have leading experts in the field that I hope will make us better understand the complex interaction between both policies. In Europe, I mean, there is an additional layer of difficulties that we have several um, sovereign member states implementing, I mean, uh, their own fiscal policy. So the panelists are Daniel Gross from the Center for European Policy Studies, Paolo Moro from the uh, International Monetary Fund, and finally, Niels Tegesen from the European Fiscal Board. I would basically like to belabor one point concerning uh, fiscal policy. Um, you mentioned earlier that, of course, this is a period when we very much think also about the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy. I cannot take all of these uh, topics into account, but uh, I would like to uh, just uh, make one general point about fiscal policy at this particular juncture. And that point is quite simply, I would say that this time is different. Now, what is different? Uh, it is different in the sense that uh, we have a uh, sectoral recession and the, uh, the shortfall in demand and supply, which we have, is not induced by uh, some sectoral imbalances or financial market restrictions, but basically the exogenous and they are very sector specific. You all know industry is doing well, services are still subject to, uh, uh, to restrictions. And that's why one really needs to distinguish between two aspects of fiscal policy, namely providing replacement income, which is necessary, and aggregate demand policies, which I think are pretty much ineffectual. The multiplier are low. I think there's no general uh, um, consensus on this because simply most of the transfers are saved. And that is a very simple economic, there's a very simple economic mechanism behind that. If I cannot go to restaurants today, even if I get more money in my bank account, I will not go, I cannot spend it all. Now, theoretically, I could spend it all on other goods, but if you think about the intertemporal consumption function with a basket of goods, and today your basket is restricted, whereas tomorrow your basket is not restricted. What will you do? You will consume less and a little bit actually less of everything today and consume more tomorrow. And uh, that means at this particular juncture, also I would submit that the interest rate channel will be pretty ineffectual because the problem is that today, not only I cannot buy certain goods, restaurants or travel, but also because my consumption basket today is constrained, I would like to have more consumption in the future. And then at the end, I will also go quickly some have a side remark on fiscal rules, which were meant to be for Neil Stirgesen, uh, 
And I would say that actually the increased uncertainty suggests that we should be prudent in debt with debt, even if interest rates are very low. And I think Paolo Mauro has written on that extensively, so I won't be very long on that. You all know we now have a recovery. It's K-shaped in the sense that industry goes up and services is down or not really down, but depending on where you sit, the US or Europe, it does not do really very well. And the key question is, does this recovery need to be pushed by aggregate demand policies? That is, I think, uh, uh, for the key question for fiscal policy. And here I'd say, if you look at the aggregate fiscal policy now, you have to distinguish between these two elements I mentioned earlier, namely whether you re provide replacement income or uh, whether you go over and beyond that, trying to uh, 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 put more to at least potential aggregate, aggregate demand in people's pockets. And uh, some of the research, which you also know, suggests that actually the fiscal policy multiplier is much lower for the general economic reasons, which I mentioned earlier. And we see it all in the household uh, savings balances. Here, I would like to make one important point, which uh, I think is that people have misunderstood the lesson from the last recession. And that's why I have here a long uh, quote from Olivier Blanchard, where he says that uh, the size of the multiplier today does not affect the timing of fiscal consolidation. If you have to do a fiscal consolidation, the time, time path is important. And the time path should basically be uh, in line with the multipliers. You do lots of fiscal consolidation when the multiplier is high and less uh, when it's low. In a recession where you have financial disturbances, the multiplier at the beginning is high because many people are cash constrained. Whereas in the sectoral recession, which we have right now, I would actually argue it's the opposite. Today, the multiplier is low. Tomorrow, it should return to normal. And that's what I would say. Today, you should start consolidation early. Uh, and then uh, later, if there is something we need for support or uh, fiscal uh, aggregate demand uh, support, then you can still do it. So the lessons which everybody says last time we did too little and we did not uh, we, we consolidated too early. I think that lesson does not translate because today is different. I think that's very important. Now, how does it play out? Um, here I've given you for the euro area. Uh, the output gap, which is in red, and the deficit, which is in blue. So what you see is in 2020, it was basically income support. And now 2021, when actually the economy is going, uh, we have an attempt to have aggregate demand, uh, which actually trans goes, is supposed to go on in 2022. So actually when we needed less, uh, governments on average in the euro area are engaging in very large aggregate demand support, which, as I said earlier, I think at this point in time will actually not be very uh, efficient. Actually, uh, if you look at the, the, the fiscal impulse as it is generally uh, uh, accept or generally measured, which is the difference between the deficits between two periods, I'm taking the pre-COVID period 2019 and 2021 when the need for income support is already much reduced. What I find interesting is that when actually, if you look at the G3, Euro area together, United Kingdom and United States, the increase in the deficit over this period is actually very similar, around 10 percentage points. Uh, a little bit less for the Euro area. What is also interesting that is that within the Euro area, there are very large differences. Spain turns out to have been, uh, have had the uh, smallest deterioration in this deficit with uh, Germany the largest, Germany and Italy together. Of course, two countries which have a very similar, dissimilar, very different starting position. So when you look at the demand impulse, I said actually overall, there's not a large difference across the Atlantic, but very large differences actually within the euro. Let me come to uh, one uh, lesson which I think one needs to draw from this, uh, uh, from this recession. 
I think we need to uh, acknowledge that the distribution of economic shocks has large tails, larger, fatter than we think or we thought beforehand. Now, if you think also that the cost of uh, high debt is convex in the debt level, basically because a higher debt level makes it more likely that you get in a fiscal crisis, then if you have a higher variability of uh, shocks, that means that theta is variables, you should have a lower target debt level. So that means you should be prudent. You should not let deficits just increase because you say anyway R minus G is negative, but you say should say because the variability of shocks, our estimate has increased, we should be more prudent than before. Let me make a very short second parenthesis, which is uh, we have very often said uh, we need money to buy basically people off so that we can make uh, reforms. This should be the ideal period to make reforms because the governments are throwing money around like mad, right? What are they doing instead? When they're giving replacement income, they say to people, you get this replacement income only if you stay with your same job. So they freeze the economy in place at a time when we know that actually sectoral changes are even more important than before. So this is, I think, another lost opportunity in terms of fiscal policy, not only are probably the overall deficits too large, but one could have used the fiscal support which was given to actually buy off um, um, opposition to reforms, and that has not been done, unfortunately. Aggregate demand policies are not effectual now, they're not needed, and that applies to both monetary and fiscal policy. And uh, we should stay prudent on the debt levels. And the, the, the fiscal effort which you're making, even if it is too much, then at least uh, should be uh, should be made in such a way that it incentivizes people to accept reforms and not by uh, telling them you get reforms only if you stay in your place. Thank you very much, Daniel. The next speaker is, is Paolo. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. I'm going to take a slightly more global uh, perspective and uh, also I'm going to focus on the fiscal uh, because that's my job, but I will talk about monetary policy, fiscal policy interactions towards the end of my remarks. I'm going to begin by really encouraging this important audience to read the IMF's fiscal monitor. Uh, from April 2021, uh, the title is A Fair Shot, and uh, it looks at issues of uh, distribution uh, of income, but also of opportunities, and that's what I'm going to draw my remarks from. I'm going to begin with two facts. The first fact relates to the level of public debt for the advanced economies on average as a share of GDP. Um, and that was 80% in 2007, just prior to the global financial crisis. At the end of 2019, it was 104, uh, so just prior to the pandemic. And then right now, we are projecting for the end of 2021 that it will be at 123. So the pandemic has resulted in a rise in debt by about 20 percentage points for the typical advanced economy. From 2021 on, under the baseline, we project a stable debt ratio. Again, it was 80 in uh, 2007. It's now going to be above 120. But it's going to be stable in the baseline with one caveat, which is that, of course, there are a lot of contingent liabilities out there. There are a lot of loans, guarantees that have been provided by some of the major advanced economies. So that's that's a risk factor that, that we keep watching. Uh, following up from what uh, Daniel mentioned, I want to make the case that when we look at the fiscal support that was provided during the pandemic. It was necessary, appropriate, and uh, it saved lives and it saved livelihoods. Uh, it is actually not 
appropriate to think about what was done in 2020 as stimulus, but rather it's support. So the idea was simply to help people stay at home. And the idea was to make sure they can feed themselves. And it was also to support firms so that they don't go bankrupt and they don't, uh, we don't get scarring after the pandemic. Um, I think it's accurate to say that uh, ideally targeting would have been more refined, uh, but on balance, I would say that uh, the support that was provided was, was extremely appropriate and effective. Um, the second point I will make, uh, the second fact is about uh, the interest bill as a share of GDP. And that has been on a slightly declining trend for many years now. Uh, but then when I look at the projections, uh, it's actually going to accelerate. That decline is going to accelerate at least through 2023. And then I stopped looking at the projections. This is not just the ECB. This is a global trend. We see it in most countries. Um, maybe monetary policy has something to do with it because, of course, interest rates at the short end have been low in part because of policies by the central banks. Uh, but it is something that has been going on for a long time. And those two facts, high debt and low interest rates, are clearly going to shape uh, the way we, we look at the path going forward uh, for, for some time. Now, what are the quick policy implications? The first is that with low interest rates, We've been making the case for a long time, even prior to the pandemic, that public investment is a very good use of public money. Uh, you get a big bang for the buck. Of course, public investment has to be high quality. It has to be monitored, et cetera. But essentially, uh, when we look at something like the next generation EU funds, that's a fantastic opportunity that countries need to use. Uh, we were making the case for public investment prior to the pandemic, but the case has gone up uh, with the pandemic. Uh, in the October 2020 fiscal monitor, we estimated that a one percentage point of GDP increase in public investment by the advanced economies and emerging markets would have a massive multiplier and it would result in 20 to 33 million jobs. The reason is that uncertainty is extremely high, private investment is very low, and really public investment can provide an opportunity to crowd in public inve sorry, private investment. Uh, so in that case, the multiplier is extraordinarily high. These are not normal times. And more generally, when interest rates are low, we tend to think of multipliers as being high. Uh, the second implication, of course, is that now is the time to think about the direction for fiscal policy going forward. What is going to be the debt anchor? Are we going to just stabilize the debt or do we want to gradually reduce it? Given that there will be another pandemic or another asteroid that hits us at some point, we don't know what it is, we don't know when, but it, it is accurate that there is a case for uh, on that basis, a gradual reduction, perhaps, in the debt ratio. But the most important point I want to make is that at the same time that countries increased uh, spending, uh, the right thing to do is to reassure the markets and to reassure the public that there is a medium-term fiscal framework in place that gives some clarity as to uh, what is going to happen in the medium term. Now, let me talk about monetary policy, fiscal policy interactions during the global financial crisis and during the pandemic. Clearly, monetary policy has become more active and more experimental, uh, maybe, in the uh, global financial crisis, but it's really expanded the range of tools massively. If one looks back uh, to the past 10-15 uh, years, we have learned an enormous amount. And uh, during the uh, pandemic, again, we've had massive fiscal support, 
We've also had extraordinarily accommodative monetary policies. We've seen major support, particularly in March 2020, when there was concern about market functioning uh, and liquidity problems. Uh, we've seen an accommodative stance from uh, most of the major central bank and that had enormous uh, success in stabilizing the situation. That was not the case during the global financial crisis. Let's remember that uh, quantitative easing was a sort of novelty at the time and QE came very late in Europe. Uh, if you, I, I remember a quote by the Italian finance minister uh, at the beginning of the global financial crisis and, and he said something along the lines of he wasn't going to be able to do any kind of fiscal stimulus because um, the market would have punished it. Just think how different the situation was during the pandemic. All advanced economies were able to do fiscal support as necessary. And that's something that was feasible in large part because of the stance by the central banks and asset purchases. The other thing that I thought was particularly interesting during the pandemic is that many emerging market central banks engaged in asset purchase programs. They were smaller, uh, but they were helpful. And um, I think what we have learned from that experience is that there are limitations to the effectiveness of uh, asset purchases by central banks. Essentially, when there's concerns about inflation, when there's concerns that the central bank might uh, be acting not in its own, uh, not, not in the interest of its own objectives, but rather because of fiscal purposes, that's when the constraints start to come in. And so th that's where you hit the limitations. Uh, so obviously it has to be an independent central bank. It has to be acting in pursuit of its own objectives, uh, low inflation, but uh, at, at a reasonable level. Um, and uh, if you are in, in that kind of situation, it's important to, to, to use all the tools available. Now, looking at the situation in Europe right now, inflation expectations are still below target. You know, interest rates at the long end are ex extremely low. So we are in a situation where it continues to be appropriate to, um, to provide uh, support uh, through monetary policy. So bottom line, monetary policy can remain accommodative. Fiscal support should continue until the recovery is underway. Again, I emphasize fiscal support, not generalized stimulus. Um, and it's crucial now to have medium-term fiscal frameworks in place. I'm very interested, for example, in the UK's experience where they announced that there will be forthcoming tax increases uh, as soon as the situation stabilizes. I'll just end on a final point about distribution. Uh, distributional perspectives. Again, the title of our fiscal monitor is a fair shot, and, and we, we look at that. Uh, we look at inequality of incomes and opportunities. And from there, we see that there will be a need for additional support to public services, basic public services such as healthcare, education, and so on. And in order to finance that, for most advanced economies, it would be appropriate to look at progressive taxation in the context of uh, medium-term fiscal frameworks and in the context of pursuing a medium-term anchor uh, on debt and, and fiscal policies. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paolo. So, and thank you also to Daniel. I would like just uh, to make uh, two short points on Daniel. I mean, I, I'm not quite sure that I, um, I got the po your policy recommendation. Maybe I didn't get it right. I mean, you, you, in what you said, I had the feeling that you were regretting that during, I mean, the, the acute phase of the crisis, so let's say 2020 and up to now, I mean, there were not at this stage more, let's say, incentives provided by government, I mean, for the economy to reallocate. And this is what I have understood, so correct me if I am wrong. But the question is that 
how can you really um, you know, implement such policies in real time where you are in a situation basically where the constraints in your economy, I mean, they start to bind in all possible, you know, kind of industries and so on and so forth. And sometimes you even, don't even know in real time where actually your, your actual needs are. So, I mean, I, I would like you to clarify this point, whether it's a point really on the past or, or a point that then it becomes, to my view, much more relevant, I mean, for the, the during along the recovery path that you you have to allow for more you know and provide more incentive uh, incentives for reallocation of resources on, in the economy the second thing that uh, i would like to to say is on 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 paolo is on the um, whether I, I get right your your message there which i have understood you know you 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 highlighted the limitation of policies i mean uh, in particular on, on monetary policy and you also emphasize the need for I mean, um, sound medium term uh, fiscal framework, or I guess also monetary policy framework for for that matter. Is it that you, you, your, your point is that actually, I mean, because some people are also looking for a new paradigm, I mean, of interaction between monetary and fiscal policy, is your point that in fact, actually the reason why, I mean, all these tools that we have are actually effective is due to the fact that we have, in a sense, sound frameworks that allow for this interaction, and that maybe by, by trying to look at, or for, I mean, if we were to go or to look for other kind of paradigm, we may also undermine, in fact, uh, the effectiveness of, of, of monetary or fiscal policy and their interaction in crisis time. So these are my, my two points. Maybe I give you, uh, again, the floor shortly, first to, to Daniel, then to Paolo. Let me say, first of all, in terms of policy descriptions, I wanted to say that uh, this year, 2021, uh, of course, we still have to provide some replacement income, but we don't need to go very much beyond that. So it's a difference between replacement income needed, which is approximately equal to the output gap, right? And what is actually provided. I mean, Larry Summers has basically uh, said the same thing for the US. Uh, his calculation is that uh, uh, the replacement income needed for U.S. workers uh, is, I forgot now, 250 billion per, per month, right? Um, and uh, you have trillions uh, of, uh, of support, of support, of, of deficits. So that was my, my main point. And this, I think, is done somewhat less in, the, in Europe, but I still, it is still being done. Uh, and I say, as I said, this is very important for me that uh, the lesson from last crisis do a lot and do it early because uh, then the multipliers are high should be unlearned. On your question uh, on how to incentivize uh, adjustment when you provide a lot of support, I totally agree with you. In the first months, you don't know what to do; just throw the money out, right, and make sure people people can survive. That's totally clear. But at the end of the year 2020, uh, things were already different. You had time to think about it. And I think by that time, uh, you could have uh, combined the, the, the replacement income with incentives. Let me give you one example of one measure, which is the exact opposite which I have in mind, which is uh, what the Italians call il blocco dei licenziamenti. So you cannot fire anybody, right? And that has continued until July. And the firm which receives uh, uh, short-term working uh, support is forbidden to fire anybody. And that I think is the wrong measure at this point in time. Thank you, Daniel. So Paolo, Paolo on the, uh, on the frameworks. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Uh, actually, uh, it's a very uh, important insight that you brought to the uh, discussion. I hadn't really thought about it. So if I interpret what you said correctly, what you're saying is that it's only because countries had sound frameworks, inflation targeting, uh, they were credible to begin with, it's only because of that that they were able to provide all this support and things were fine. I mean, in the grand scheme of things from uh, from the perspective of being able to help people, help firms when it was necessary, uh, 
in a way that did not impair uh, macroeconomic stability. Um, I agree with that. I think that uh, the implication of what you're saying for fiscal policy going forward is exactly that, indeed, we do have to start thinking about what about the next pandemic? And so, on the one hand, I think we don't want to undermine the recovery right now, but it is also important that we do go back to some sort of uh, uh, clarity and reassurance that there is a framework in place. I think the only thing that I will add, which is, is not inconsistent with what you say, is do we really know that the debt to GDP ratio is the right metric? Do we uh, really know that, you know, 60% is the right number or 100% is the right number? I honestly don't think we're going to be able to answer those questions, uh, but I think it is incumbent upon us to really do the work to figure out are these the right types of anchors? And I think that that work is ongoing in many places, including in Europe. Um, and I don't, I honestly don't want to guess uh, how that's going to come out. Uh, my, my own gut feeling is that uh, presumably we want to do some gradual fiscal adjustment over the next years. Uh, but again, I think the crucial point now is that there has to be some anchor that, again, will provide that ability to provide support as necessary. Um, I also want to add something to uh, what um, Daniel said. I think absolutely, as we start to emerge out of the lockdowns, it is the right time to start thinking about public policies that facilitate reallocation of workers. Um, I would say the most important question is figuring out speedy bankruptcy proceedings that work. Um, and, uh, you know, yes, I think many economists, including many at the IMF, have made the point that uh, over time, it, you know, one wants to move away from supporting jobs and and wants to move towards supporting people the principle is correct the reality is it's very hard one really needs to go to the institutional details of how to do that and i i think it's just uh something that has to be has to be done uh but it's not going to be trivial in practice so yeah <laughs> Thank you. I mean, uh, yeah, it's it's never trivial in practice. In fact, that's that's a problem. There is good news as well uh, for the panel. Niels Niels Tigerson managed to to join us. Niels, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jean Pierre, and apologies for the uh, delay in, in joining. Uh, I did hear Paolo, but not uh, Daniel, as I would have wanted to. But let me uh, differentiate my own approach a little bit by taking a long perspective on the question of interaction between monetary and fiscal policy, uh, um, because uh, such long-term perspectives can sometimes uh, teach us that uh, a mood may swing too far in one direction or the other. And I want to distinguish uh, in the short presentation uh, four phases in the perspective in the European uh, Union on the balance between monetary and fiscal policy, emphasizing mostly uh, fiscal policy because I currently chair the European Fiscal Board, although I do not want to make my colleagues responsible for my remarks, that is presently my uh, main perspective. Uh, the first phase in that long history since uh, 1970 uh, is the first plan for EMU, uh, the Bernier Plan of 1970, um, where there was a strong confidence in coordinated national fiscal policy uh, and faster growth. Uh, not surprisingly, in a way, because uh, before that, uh, we had uh, almost two decades of uh, strong growth, uh, very expansionary fiscal policies, but also uh, growth that was so fast that revenues kept pace with the uh, expenditures. Um, fiscal policy was seen as a game in town, and, and although uh, 
uh, monetary union attracted some attention. The main ambition in that early plan was to go even further and delegate some authority to the European level for fiscal policy and improve it further, both with respect to its stabilizing properties and its uh, ability to raise uh, the long-term growth rate. You can say that was uh, the seed of the uh, idealistic view of fiscal policy making. Uh, that soon ended in disillusion uh, in the years of stagflation and uh, divergence within Europe that followed between roughly 1971 and 1984. Uh, fiscal policies in that period were often uh, pro-cyclical. Um, the energy crisis provided a supply shock, some resemblance maybe to the present time. Uh, fiscal policy at times made it worse uh, by trying to uh, uh, stimulate demand at a time when that was not feasible really. Uh, and massive uh, inflation developed uh, and exchange rates were all over the place. Uh, the emphasis gradually uh, on the fiscal side also shifted towards a longer term perspective and structural adjustment. But it wasn't until we get to the third phase, which starts approximately in the mid uh, uh, 80s, um, that we see a new phase, uh, what I call the Maastricht bargain between fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, the basic Maastricht bargain was one where uh, Low and stable inflation and interest rates were seen as linked closely to the introduction of a single currency. And the benefits of providing that through emerging the European currencies uh, uh, were seen to be offset by or compensated by uh, more fiscal constraints than we have seen in the past. Uh, certainly a medium term view on, on uh, fiscal policy. Um, Economic theory at that time had also emphasized strongly the value of medium term commitments for both monetary and fiscal policy, maybe particularly for monetary policy. We had the early exper experiments with inflation targets in that period, uh, but also with medium term uh, budget uh, planning and rules were becoming a very popular concept for both uh, central banks and other policymakers. Stressing that central bank independence uh, was important uh, with price medium term price stability as a prime objective. Uh, it's important to remember that that bargain was at the time supported not only, and of course, not surprisingly by the central bankers, but also by finance ministers who felt that uh, the growth of expenditures was moving a bit too fast. So they had difficulties in controlling some of their spending colleagues at home. So uh, they were ready to accept some form of an external anchor in the shape of the rules that we see in the Maastricht uh, Treaty. The implication of this uh, division of uh, labor, and it was really a sharp division, was that monetary and fiscal policies developed very different agendas in a double sense. Uh, uh, monetary policy focused on price stability through its inflation target, uh, and it focused strictly on the aggregates uh, of the euro area uh, economies, not individual countries, whereas uh, fiscal policy makers uh, were supposed to deal individually uh, with country behavior and monitor them through a process of surveillance. Um, I would say that bargain lasted uh, uh, even beyond the financial crisis of 2007 8, maybe too long for some. Uh, that uh, crisis did not break the bargain. It prompted the repair of some other deficiencies in economic and monetary union, a safety net uh, since the European Central Bank was not supposed to be a lender of last resort. Uh, the uh, European stability mechanism was uh, devised to uh, take care of conditional lending and moves were undertaken to uh, establish a banking union. Uh, and there was also some flexibility introduced in fiscal surveillance gradually. Uh, but it's important then to know what did we then learn in the financial crisis and the subsequent sovereign debt crisis. Uh, I think we learned not so much that uh, it was wrong to use austerity of fiscal policy, but it was wrong to be so exposed as one had uh, little scope for doing anything else but being very cautious on fiscal policy, unproductively uh, contractionary sometimes. So the basic bargain, I would argue, lasted almost until the pandemic, uh, but the lopsided mix of policies that emerged gradually uh, 
with A, accommodating monetary policy and more cautious fiscal policies was, of course, uh, evident uh, to, uh, to many observers. And there was criticism of austerity uh, right until the pandemic, somewhat unjustified, I think, uh, after 2013, uh, as we have tried to document in the European Fiscal Board. But um, the, the differences in objectives, uh, the inflation target for the central bank and employment GDP targets for uh, fiscal authorities uh, really uh, made sure that the, the uh, uh, package was not substantially revised. That bargain uh, is now clearly uh, seen by most people, I would say, as outdated uh, fiscal constraints, rules that focus on sustainability, uh, can no longer be claimed to be a prerequisite for low inflation because low inflation is now a consequence of uh, a long uh, trend-wise uh, decline in, in uh, inflation rates and an equilibrium interest rates. So um, the pandemic has further nailed a view that was already emerging in the pre-pandemic uh, period. Uh, remember that the ECB already at that time asked for more fiscal expansion to make monetary and fiscal policies strategically complementary, uh, no longer substitutes. They have clearly become that now, as is explained uh, most clearly in a, a remarkable report, uh, the Geneva report from last year, to which also my colleagues at the uh, Lebrun uh, contributed. But um, if we look now at uh, uh, the situation in 2020 and beyond, uh, national governments have uh, appropriately and, and uh, underpinned also by joint European action responded in a massive way uh, to the severe downtown, uh, downturn. Uh, but interest rates have still remained low uh, due to the main uh, program, uh, asset purchase programs that the ECB has undertaken. Maybe they are now rising, but uh, in the general view, mostly on a temporary uh, basis. Um, so uh, when we look at, at the situation, there's clearly a need to update what I call the Maastricht uh, bargain, but more an, an update than a full relegation to limbo. I come back to that once we have looked at three graphs that I have on the next two pages. Uh, here we have the long-term uh, picture over the 50 years. Uh, the left-hand figure is the rise of uh, average uh, GDP, uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio, uh, rising from about 30% of GDP in, in uh, at the time of the Van Air report of 1970 to around 100 uh, today. But of course, a lot of variation around it. And you will see it has been on an upward trend, except for a period uh, shortly after the uh, EMU had been put on uh, uh, in motion, uh, the 15 years between the early 90s and 2007 or so, actually the period when the debt ratio is declining. But then you'll see it jumps up sharply and further in uh, 2020. The government deficit on the right-hand side uh, is also uh, always higher than zero. Uh, and there's a kind of ratchet effect also, if you watch that uh, carefully. And most dramatically, of course, it's the rise in expenditure ratios in 2020. Uh, the next slide uh, shows um, a different story, but, but somewhat the same. Uh, if we just focus on the yellow uh, line here, uh, the uh, yellow line is the ratio of primary expenditures, net of, of interest rates, public expenditures to GDP. You, it's on the right-hand uh, side. It's measured, it rises from about 35% or one-third approximately to GDP to nearly one-half at the end of the period. Uh, and look at the red dots. These are the years in which uh, the output gap was at zero. And you see no relation between the uh, movements in the expenditure ratio as an indicator of thrust of policies and the situation with respect to the use of, of resources. So the stabilizing properties of fiscal policy uh, are very hard to detect uh, throughout this period of, of 50 years, uh, I would argue. Let's turn uh, finally to uh, a bit uh, of the future, the implications for the future, a longer term scenario for the future. When the recovery is uh, well underway, and let us hope that it looks that way right now, uh, certainly in the course of 2022, one will have to find a better balance between supporting a return to growth and some protection of the longer term sustainability of public finances uh, 
also in the more normal times which should uh, follow after this. Uh, overconfidence in the potential of fiscal policy uh, has led uh, to a constant tendency for public expenditure goals to outstrip revenues. Uh, and that is uh, true even when you calculate in the uh, lower burdens of debt servicing costs, which have, of course, increased what is sustainable in terms of debt relative to the early ideas and also the 60% in the Maastricht uh, Treaty. Uh, and this uh, tendency has now been, I think, uh, of confidence in fiscal policy has been further accentuated by the boost from the success in mitigating the pandemic, which clearly is the main outcome of 2020, and the diminished attention to the underlying trend growth uh, in the under normal drivers of public expenditure, which have been mainly social expenditures and public consumption, and they are continuing on their rising path. And that is the thing why we should not focus only on the uh, balance between uh, debt servicing costs and economic growth, but also at the likely development of the primary deficit in the future, which could override even fairly favorable, uh, fairly favorable constellations of uh, interest rates and growth. So it's not necessary, I think, to um, invoke the fear of inflation or seeing some dangers in the current scenario if it is allowed to continue without some effort to install a rules-based framework again. Uh, uh, that the inefficiencies in rapid growth of uh, public expenditures, the inability to uh, uh, get agreement to raise revenues uh, to match it. Uh, so um, uh, I think we are back to uh, the, the discussion also raised by uh, Paolo, I noted that uh, there is a need for looking at carefully at uh, uh, a longer term framework, which does contain some rules that need revision, but not total scrapping, because we do need some constraints in the long run. And we do need to revive the uh, view of finance ministers again, that they are also responsible for keeping public expenditures on a trend that doesn't outpace revenues too much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Niels, for, for these, uh, I think, extremely uh, insightful and useful historical perspective. I mean, on the, uh, in a sense, on uh, that very much also uh, is, uh, you know, part and parcel of the European uh, history and the story of European integration. So I find that extremely um, fascinating, also very, um, I mean, to the point uh, currently, when we we are about, I mean, probably in a, in a, in a couple of months, I mean, the, the next six months to relaunch a discussion on fiscal framework in in, in Europe, uh, where, in fact, we should also not lose sight that uh, we have already reformed several times, I mean, our framework, and at each point in time, I think it's important to, to adapt to the current circumstances, but also not to lose our thread of the uh, importance, let's say, of the basic tenets of, uh, let's, say, let's say, sustainability. And as you say, I mean, to have uh, an expenditure pass that is uh, by and large consistent with the revenue pass and also to think, I think, and that's the question that I would also, uh, I think, raise for, for the other panelists of uh, what kind of role do we really want, I mean, for the state and governments in the, in the future? I mean, is it actually to act as an insurer, I mean, of all kind of risk and then, I mean, to cover uh, whatever losses the private sector makes, I mean, but I mean, even, uh, you know, individual citizens are the one to organize that a little bit differently by uh, also giving uh, more uh, way on the weight on the uh, role of, uh, let's say, of governance in, uh, in structuring the economy via public infrastructure, and in particular, as you, some of you mentioned, uh, next generation of you, I mean, the notion that, I mean, there, there is a role for government, I mean, to kickstart, in fact, the green on digital transition in a sense, and that has to be also through, through public investment. On these, I would like to give um, Daniel and Paolo uh, an opportunity to, to react to Niels. Daniel? Um, first of all, it's good to see Niels again. Um, I, I agree that uh, there is uh, a need for a longer term view as he presented and that at times there is uh, let's say an illusion that uh, fiscal policy could somehow uh, foster growth uh, just by providing a demand stimulus uh, permanently. Let me just make one comment about 
investment. Because investment is one of these motherhood and apple pie things. Nobody can be against investment. Especially nobody can be against efficient investment. Nobody, right? But uh, unless you change the government apparatus, uh, unless you have evidence as a structural change there, the prediction must be that more money allocated to investment today will have the same efficiency as it had in the past. And we know that in some European countries that is low. But my principal point about investment is very simple. One can make the argument that building up public capital, or as a double dividend, and therefore it should be allowed to accumulate debt. One can agree with that. But the key point is an, an adjective which is almost always forgotten, which is net capital formation. You can make a case that you can finance net capital formation uh, with debt, not gross investment. And if you look at Europe, which is a low growth economy, net capital formation by the public sector is very low. Even in countries with a considerable effort to have high growth investment, it is never more than, let's say, 1% of GDP. So you cannot justify deficits of four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent of GDP with the need to have more investment or to have more public uh, capital. So I think it's the net which should be looked at, and that is macroeconomically speaking not relevant. Or I. I I think Daniel just made the case for more public investment uh, by saying that net public investment has been very low. I think if you look at the evidence, uh, there's been massive under investment in public infrastructure. Um, I think we have some statistics in the October fiscal monitor that report that something like half of the water infrastructure in France has to be replaced in the next few years uh, for safety reasons. We see bridges collapsing and so on. But I, I take the point that uh, efficiency of public investment is crucial. And uh, I think that's definitely something that uh, needs to be looked at in the context of the next generation EU funds. What I can say is that the IMF has a very active program where we help countries uh, go over uh, their public investment management processes. Um, it's an assessment that we do in many countries. We did it in Ireland a few years ago. The minister really uh, was very happy with the results in terms of looking at the priority areas for improvement. We, we have statistics on the great variation in efficiency of public investment around the world and it does uh, it does seem like it's uh, for example much less uh, efficient in, in emerging economies where typically the procedures for selection and management of projects are weaker so i think that it's absolutely right that efficiency is is a priority uh, the fact that uh, public investment is uh, not macroeconomically relevant, I would I would not view it that way. I think it is macroeconomically relevant because it's what uh, is necessary to crowd in private investment and uh, ultimately improve the long run growth rate of, of the economy. Um, it is true that uh, the massive expansion of fiscal deficits during the crisis uh, really resulted from completely different factors. Um, so, so that's my my five cents worth. Um, on Niels, I I really enjoyed the uh, the, the perspective, uh, not just the historical perspective, but more more generally the analytical perspective. There's one point where I I felt uh, that there's 
and this is a sort of something I observe in many discussions of policies in Europe in general, there seems to be uh, a sort of, if you allow me, an ideological uh, view that uh, expenditure is uh, sort of the problem and revenues are are not. Um, I, I, I heard you say that public expenditure growth has been outstripping revenues and we need to put a cap on expenditure. Well, I think that's a political decision that depends very much on country circumstances. And it may be that in some countries, the state is too large, but that's a decision that citizens have to make. I remember a very nice statement by Anders Borg, uh, who was the finance minister of Sweden a few years ago, who made the point that he, he said his citizens are fiscally conservative because they want to preserve a large welfare state. And so my, my point is simply that when we look at public finance sustainability, there's no need to be asymmetric. The revenue side is as important as the expenditure side. And I think that's important now because the pandemic worsened inequalities and it also exposed inequalities in access to public services. And so from my perspective, it's important that uh, as we emerge from the crisis, we now look at ways of financing public services that are needed. Um, and that will require uh, additional taxation and most advanced economies can reverse the erosion of taxation corporates and the erosion of taxation on high income people. Uh, over the past 20, 30 years. So there's a scope for reversing that erosion and having a more progressive taxation going forward. Thank, thank you very much um, to both of you. I mean, we have, we have a number of questions actually from, uh, from, the, uh, from the audience. And uh, so Ernest, uh, I think uh, maybe you can, uh, you can read them uh, to the panelists and then we, we can have a kind of uh, an exchange on those questions, right? Yes, with great pleasure. I have a question here from Sultan Salai. And Jordan uh, writes, I agree that this time is different and perhaps the fiscal multiplier is low due to high savings, but happily we do not need high, a high multiplier for the recovery because savings are temporary in the sense that they are a result of restrictions in the service sector, self-imposed or government imposed. So we cannot be content with a sluggish recovery. If there is a re if there are reopening frictions, these should be temporary then i have a second question by giovanni caligari over the medium term aren't we facing the risk that increased fiscal activism might push economies towards a ricardian trap japan would be a typical example of this in which increased deficit and debt is matched by elevated household savings and central bank purchases with limited and very temporary impact on growth. And then I have a third question from Olivier Kemmler. Since we are discussing interactions between monetary policy and fiscal policy, it would be very interesting in getting the panelists' views about fiscal dominance in the new normal. Okay, Daniel, go ahead. Perhaps I can uh, combine the two. Um, I must admit, I don't get quite the gist of the first question. I mean, my point was that the economy will recover more or less at its own pace when the restrictions are lifted. And also people, as uh, it's also the case, people are less reluctant to go out on their own. But we don't need to get demand management for that. And on top of that, people are sitting on a lot of uh, a liquid balances, which they could spend if they wanted. Our usual models say uh, we need fiscal policy because we have cash constrained consumers. Now, I, I challenge you to find a single cash constrained consumer in Germany these days. Uh, 
uh, so I think at that point, uh, fiscal policy as in terms of aggregate demand management is not needed. Let me just also then the second one is connected with Japan. And that is related to something which uh, Paolo certainly knows. Um, Japan uh, followed the advice, invest in infrastructure to the letter and with gusto in the 1990s. At one point in time, they had, I think, a, a in public sector uh, investment to GDP a ratio of 7% of GDP, right? Whereas 2 to 3% in Europe are normal. And they overbuilt massively. Impact on growth? I don't know where you can find it. Okay, so uh, Paolo or Nils? Paolo? Can come in for a moment. Um, I mean, I I agree with uh, Daniel. I I hope that the recovery will be very strong. Um, I mean, what we're seeing here in the United States is a very strong recovery. Basically, as soon as uh, people feel safe, they go back to their usual lives. And my hope. My sincere hope is that that can happen in Europe as well. I'm extremely concerned about the fact that the rest of the world is not there. It may be that we'll have mutations of the virus because we're not vaccinating people in emerging markets quickly enough. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of what we've seen here in the US, uh, hopefully the same will happen in Europe. I don't think anybody's talking about uh, tax cuts or or generalized fiscal stimulus. I don't think that would make any any economic sense. But providing fiscal support to those who need it, I do think is still appropriate. There are still people who are not able to take up their 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 jobs. I I find it uh, almost offensive, frankly, to say that there are no cash constrained people in Germany. I mean, I I don't know about Germany, but there are people who who really have trouble getting to the end of the month. And uh, I mean, here in the United States, for sure, uh, there's a large section of the population that cannot uh, go to the doctor because they don't have the cash to do so. And I would certainly think in Italy, where I know relatives, uh, yes, there are constraints on cash. Um, so I would, I would not dismiss the importance of um, having a better distribution of income. That said, I take the point from a macro perspective that there's a very large chunk of personal savings that have, you know, that they're just waiting to be spent on the next vacation. And I do think there will be a, a healthy return to, uh, to spending in restaurants and so on that is in the pipeline. Um, on Giovanni's question and also on the question about fiscal dominance, I think we're nowhere near fiscal dominance right now in Europe at the moment. Um, and I think in terms of whether we're going to go into a Japanese situation or not, I'm not an expert, but my sense is that let's just sort of focus on what's best for the moment right now. And uh, that will inevitably include a little bit of experimentation and that experimentation will tell us where the situation is going to go. So I would say, do what's the right thing for now. Keep providing fiscal support. Let's see what the recovery looks like. And then once we have more clarity, we can, uh, we, we, we can assess, but at the same time, I think we do need to say there will be a fiscal anchor. It's not a free for all. We do have to have some, some notion of discipline. Um, and, and that's something which is going to be, uh, hotly debated in the in the coming months. Thank you, Paolo. Um, Niels, I mean, do you want yes. to react? We have spent a lot of time also in the European Fiscal Board in devising ways in which uh, 
investment could be protected better uh, than it was the uh, case after the financial crisis. That was clearly a weakness. Uh, a general golden rule applying to uh, gross investment, as Daniel hints, uh, is too much. It's, that's, uh, that's not the way. Uh, net investment is important, but I do point out that the new uh, plan, the uh, NGU, uh, the emphasis on investment in the green transition and in digitalization is to some extent uh, gross investment, new investment, which brings new technology and progress. So you cannot look either just at uh, net investment, maybe the whole uh, macroeconomic approach has to be broken down somewhat and distinguished between what is really adding to uh, future productive capacity and what is not. Uh, so uh, careful uh, discussion of investment is, is key. And, and here, of course, the implementation of the NGU would be a crucial test on, on how well countries are prepared for that kind of, of uh, discussion. Uh, I fully agree with Paolo that it's not the task of economic advisors to um, devise a ceiling for expenditures, um, but it is not inappropriate to say that uh, in the long term there has to be a willingness on the part of the population to sustain a given rise of expenditure or a given level of expenditures. Uh, it's dangerous to rely on, on debt creation that may create the cause of the kind of, of uh, uh, Ricardian reactions that the question I referred to, which would undermine the effectiveness of fiscal policy. But I come myself from a country neighboring uh, that of Mr. Borg in Sweden, and, and there the uh, uh, atmosphere is of, of fiscal conservatism, and in the present context, worry about whether one can stay under the 60%. So the conditions are quite different. Uh, what we have to watch, of course, is that uh, there also has to be more differentiation, uh, taking into consideration individual country uh, positions. Um, I, like uh, Paolo, I, I don't think we are near fiscal dominance in Europe, uh, though it may have looked like that to someone who has just woken up maybe from a 20 year sleep after the Maastricht, uh, 30 year sleep after the Maastricht Treaty. Um, but that's clearly not the uh, uh, the reason for the current uh, strategic complementarity is simply that the two policies of fiscal and monetary policies uh, create space for each other, and that's in a sense a constructive element in the current uh, crisis, and also a reason why there's some reluctance to break up that uh, apparent agreement between uh, the ECB and the political authorities in the need for, for expansion. It becomes more difficult when policies again become substitutes for each other, as is the normal situation. That requires not outright coordination, but some, of course, understanding of policies and some, some degree of implicit, at least, uh, coordination, but not explicit. Uh, so um, uh, I don't think we are facing a snobbish recovery, frankly. I think we have a lot of, of uh, uh, growth, potential growth coming uh, from the uh, pent up demand that is, uh, has been discussed. But we do need very much to, to shift the kind of support that has been given and has been vital in, in sustaining a recovery. Uh, have to shift that in a more uh, in a sense discretionary and discriminating way uh, to uh, continue in, uh, uh, in a more, let's say, growth friendly uh, way uh, for the future that has longer term implications. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Neil. So uh, now um, I give the floor to, to Catherine Mann. Well, thanks very much. Um, I've really enjoyed this discussion and I've enjoyed seeing my friends uh, online, but you know, that's the way we do it these days. My question um, really is uh, posed to the very different view of fiscal multipliers that were uh, proposed by Paolo and Daniel. I mean, Daniel, you had low multipliers because constrained consumption. Uh, Paolo, you had high multipliers because fiscal catalyzed uh, private sector investment. Um, these are very different multipliers. You've spoken to them just a bit, but I'd like you to uh, talk a little bit more about them, particularly with the focus on restructuring and potential output, because those are two key elements that we have to be thinking about going forward in the context of Here's a big crisis, or is it, you know, what's, how are we going to come out of this? Here's a lot of debt. How are we going to repay? Thank you. It depends on what items you're looking at. Uh, the fiscal multiplier, uh, if you're giving a generalized stimulus in the middle of a lockdown, 
then the fiscal multiplier will be very low because if you give me extra cash, I'm not going to go and spend it because I don't need it and, uh, and I cannot go to the restaurant anyway. However, if you can target it, then that's a very high multiplier because you allow somebody to buy groceries uh, who would not otherwise be able to, to buy them. And we've, we've seen cases like that. Um, on investment, I think that uh, our econometric analysis gets these huge multipliers because we've inserted a measure of uncertainty. And so you have low interest rates, you have high uncertainty. If you put those two things together, you get massive multipliers. But you're absolutely right that um, if, you're, if you're looking at, again, general stimulus or provision of cash to uh, high income households, then that's basically uh, down the toilet. It's, it's, it's not helpful during, during a lockdown. Um, so, um, I, 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 sorry that I jumped in, but I, I think there's a very logical way of reconciling these different estimates. In general, I think it will be true as we get out of the pandemic that if interest rates remain low, then the multiplier is going to be higher than in a situation in which interest rates are high. Uh, that's sort of standard from even prior to the pandemic. So I, sorry, I, I view this as a technical discussion and that's why I kind of jumped in. Thanks. I don't agree with you, but let's let Daniel respond. Daniel. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> now, first point I wanted to make is that the key issue is, as I mentioned earlier, the expected time path of the multiplier, right? So let's assume interest rates remain low. So that's a constant. What, how will the time path of the multiplier look like if the restrictions are gradually lifted? I would argue that the time path of the multiplier is upwards. It will go higher to become more normal. Right? Now, Paula mentioned quite correctly, there are two things. You provide the replacement income and that is indispensable. I was not arguing that you should not do that. Preferably, of course, in target matter. Since it might be difficult to comment on the US, let me take Germany. This year in Germany, uh, the uh, output gap will be approximately 4%. Does that justify a deficit of 8% of GDP? 4% might be needed to provide replacement income. But there are four percentage points of GDP which are in excess. Now, of course, uh, private investment might be somewhat weaker than usual because in this particular situation, there's an option value of waiting. People just don't know whether demand will come back in the same sectors. Where will sectoral adjustment be quicker? So, and therefore you could say, yes, let us have a bit more uh, public sector investment. But how much can you realistically increase public sector investment in one year or two? Let's say if you increase it by 10 percentage points per year, which the German government has succeeded in doing over the last years, that makes 0.2 percent of GDP. So my point is, you just cannot justify uh, these very large deficits which we are seeing this year, given the reduction in the output gap, um, and given that public sector investment under the best of circumstances can uh, provide a growth impulse on its own of a fraction of a percentage point of GDP. Tomorrow is different. Tomorrow your multiplier should be back up again. Thank you very much. So I, I suggest Graham ask his question and then uh, I will turn to, to Niels. I mean, that can add uh, either reply to Graham or add uh, on, on multipliers as well. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> it's been a fascinating discussion so far, but I'm a bit concerned that we're slightly missing the elephant in the room. Um, speaking as a bond market vigilante, you'll remember that phrase, uh, the long-term trends that Niels uh, showed in public debt and actually more particularly public spending uh, are very disturbing. Have we got to the situation where society never feels it has to solve its own problems? 
it's always a question of turning to the government and the government's checkbook to uh, to do something about it. But the, the vigilantes will win. They always do, always have done. Uh, and it may be very unpleasant. Um, their winning uh, would be associated with the, the doom loop with the banks and so on. Uh, that's not gone away, far from it. Um, the, uh, the saving grace may be that there's no potential alternative for the savings of citizens. But uh, if there were to be a, a plausible alternative for those savings, um, I'm afraid this long run, these long run trends are very disturbing indeed. I don't know what I can say to my friend uh, Graham, but uh, uh, bond vigilantes have been, of course, uh, calmed down considerably uh, in this space uh, by the uh, uh, program of the uh, European Central Bank uh, to purchase uh, a very sizable part of the new issues of government bonds. Um, uh, particularly in, in uh, since 2000, March 2020, and I'm not advocating that should stop uh, right away, though some uh, uh, stop in the course of 2022 uh, might be appropriate, uh, provided that the communication that, uh, that uh, accompanies such uh, an action uh, can overcome this uh, readiness of the bond vigilantes to, uh, to take action. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some uh, uh, some uh, say more uh, slow pace of, of uh, uh, bond purchases is required in order to to have the respect for the uh, uh, fiscal rules and the deficits that I find is essential also for the long run. So there's a very careful balance to be struck here. And I think that the ECB so far has done an excellent job in, in communicating uh, how to dose this in the right way. But th that is a major challenge, but it also requires, of course, that the, one can see ahead to a time when the, uh, the the deficits, the additions to the debt are coming down. There is one last question from uh, from uh, from the audience. So it's a question from Javier, Javier Perez from Bank of Spain, where, which says what he says is the following. And there is uncertainty about the timing of the recovery. You know, I mean, and actually it's something that was quite clear in the presentation was with by Niels when he says, you know, 2022 with a question mark on his slides. And so he asked whether we see, I mean, whether you, you know, as panelists, I mean, what's your view on that? Where do you see a need to anchor already now uh, agents' expectation by announcing, you know, a kind of uh, medium-term fiscal adjustment pass or plans already now? Or, for example, it could be done, I mean, uh, so in Europe through stability and convergence program, for example. Or do you see merit in following another approach, which is by and large, I mean, a kind of more policy approach where you spend, you act, you wait, you, uh, you wait and see, and then at some point, given the uncertainty, you will announce, you know, your 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 medium term uh, fiscal plans and uh, and and adjustment plans, adjustment pass. So, what uh, do you think? I mean, would be the best approach at the current juncture? So, mi mixing a little bit, you know, what we should say about the medium term and what we should do right now. How would you approach this issue? I think it was very reasonable to uh, uh, prolong the, uh, uh, the, the activation of the uh, severe downturn clause uh, for 2022 because there's too much uncertainty, even though things are looking up a bit better than, than they did a few months ago. And we will have a recovery uh, second half of this year and quite strongly, hopefully, next year. That's also what is in the projections. Um, but I think from 2023, we have to think of, of uh, getting back to a more, uh, let's say, regulated system where we are not back to relying on the ability of the Commission to strike imp improvised compromises with countries on what to do from one year to the other. That may look safe, but I think it would be even safer if there were some strategy announced in the course of this year while we still have no rules in place. What is the future system going to look like? How are we going to deal with it? Are we going to uh, deal only with major departures from uh, a stable course of action? Uh, I think that would be the best uh, way of all. Uh, whether that is done by um, formally adopting a new set of rules that may be uh, complicated, very complicated, or by just announcing some general ideas. But we do need to extend, in a sense, the idea of forward guidance to the area of fiscal policy uh, fairly soon. Thank you. I think that you're absolutely right. There is a lot of uncertainty at the same time. There are our friends, the bond vigilantes out there. So whatever kind of uh, 
sense of direction we can provide, recognizing that there is uncertainty and recognizing that things will have to be refined later, I think it's important to provide some sense of direction. Um, I think I'm just going to leave it there. So then the last word will be for Daniel. I can only say that as of today, I'm not afraid of the bond vigilantes, uh, but uh, I would stress that uh, in times of higher uncertainty, both short term and long term, you should keep your powder dry and uh, you should have a good roof, which means low debt. And uh, I think uh, that is forgotten now that everybody is spending and thinking it doesn't cost anything. Sooner or later, bad times will return. And if we then start from high deficit levels and have also high debt burdens, we will come to regret it. Thank you very much for all of you for participating in this panel. I mean, both I mean, to the panelists and for the great presentation and discussion, also for all participants having been with us in this SWERF panel. Thank you to all of you and um, thank you for participating in this event. And so I wish you all the best for the rest of the day and great thanks again to, to the panelists for for very, very, very fascinating and insightful presentation and discussion. Thank you to all of you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.